Right. Thanks very much, Vaughan. Um, so uh, I, I'm just utterly gutted not to be there with you. I was really looking forward to this meeting. Uh, but anyway, this is better than nothing. I'm, and I'm sorry I've not been able to um, hear the conversation so far. So I'm a, I'm a neurologist in Edinburgh. I've been doing research with my colleague Alan Carson here for over 20 years on patients with, with functional disorders in a kind of neurological, in a, in a uh, uh, neurology setting. So, and I should apologize because the reason I'm not with you is COVID. I've got a bit of brain fog, uh, which uh, so it might not be my finest hours, but let's see how it goes. So I've got some declarations. Yeah, very disappointed not to be there with you. Um, I've obviously not heard the discussion earlier on and I was hoping to sort of listen to all that and, and build on it. But anyway, I'm gonna blunder into it. Um, and the other, my other declaration is that I have very, as you'll discover, very simplistic, modest views uh, about this whole area, which I was hoping to have challenged at the meeting. So, um, so that's where I'm starting from. I thought we could do just start with <clears throat> some thoughts about opposites. So these are some opposites I found on the internet, uh, in and out, uh, cold and hot, and difficult and easy. Um, and for me, the title of this day and also the title of the paper about what's the organic functional divide doing in medicine, there's, there's just a simple category error going on here, which is that the opposite of organic to me is not functional. So this, here's something that's organic, it's a chicken, it's a living object. Uh, here's something that's non-organic, so it's just a rock, and it's still not non-organic even with some googly eyes on. Um, so that, to me, is what uh, organic and non-organic is. Um, the opposite of function, or functional to me, is structural. Uh, and you can, I'm, I'm sure you have argued about that today. So the function of a, of a railway station is to deliver passengers uh, from one place to another. And the structure of the railway station is the train and the railway station. So a few years ago, uh, I'm invited to write this article for Practical Neurology in a section called Neuromythology. Um, and we're, we're invited to write about the word non-organic and what was it still doing in, in our specialty. And, uh, one of, and so this was the illustration from the article, uh, which was a picture of two organic turnips, because a picture of a non-organic turnip was unavailable and philosophically impossible. And in that, I mean, it was a slightly lighthearted article, but we were going through the, the sort of um, perversity, really, of the word non-organic when it's applied to people and conditions that they have. So if you look in the Oxford English Dictionary and you look up non-organic, it says not relating to or derived from living matter, uh, not organic. So, I mean, for me, the sort of conversation ends there, really. How can we be talking about organic and non-organic when we're talking about conditions experienced by living human beings. And of course, there's other meanings as well. Now, I know it's not as simple as that, and people, words have lots of different meanings, of course. Interestingly, with organic, the Oxford English Dictionary uh, has a few different definitions. I've not put them all in, uh, of, of a part of the body uh, relating to organs. Uh, but also, of course, there's a kind of... Um, organic chemistry type of definition. And disappointingly, they also have organic defined here, uh, produced or characterized by structural or other pathological change in an organ, not psychogenic. So they put psychogenic on the other side of that. Well, I was a bit disappointed to see that there. So, but from my very simplistic viewpoint, it, first of all, organic is not the opposite of functional. And uh, non-organic just has no relevance to medicine. So I think we just get rid of that whole category. Everything, every condition that human beings have is organic, um, in my view. So we should, and, and I know people like the word organic. They like to sort of have it uh, as a handy category. I'm going to explain to you why I think we need to abandon that. We need to let that go. We don't need it anymore. Um, and uh, we just shouldn't have it in medicine. So we'll, we'll talk about function and structure later, but of course I know that that is, has problems as well, um, but that to me is perhaps is what the question should be. 
what's the functional structural divide doing in medicine? So I, I was reflecting on causes of leg weakness. I was taught as a medical student, and I sometimes teach medical students as well about the so-called surgical sieve, although it's actually a medical sieve, really, as much as anything. So vitamin, vitamin or vitamin CD, and you can have various variants of it. If you're thinking about different problems in neurology and you want to think what the causes are, this is what medical students might learn. And then there's a, but there was a cause of leg weakness that I wasn't taught as a medical student, which was uh, functional. It didn't appear on that list. Uh, it sort of separated off into some other, other zone, something other. It doesn't, it didn't deserve to be on that, on that list. And I wanted to contrast that with um, a, a similar sort of dichotomy that you find in the 19th century, which actually, although I think all sort of dichotomies like this have their, have their problems. Um, the one, the, the, this one from Charcot, uh, the French neurologist, who really invented the clinical anatomical method. So correlating pathology with clinical findings and diseases. He, he put uh, various, disorders in this category of nevrosis. So that's not a spelling mistake. It's nev with a V, nevrosis. Now, did he, did he think they were disorders without anatomical basis or did he think they were disorders of nervous system functioning? I'm not really sure. I, I tried to have a look, uh, and I, but, but, but anyway. But interestingly, in that category, we see some of these disorders that always crop up when people are so agonizing about this uh, organic structural divide. What about migraine as a disorder that you can't see on a conventional brain scan, but does have a pathophysiology that we understand to a degree? What about epilepsy? Often that, you, know, you don't see that on a structural, structural imaging. Pain, of course, Korea at that time as well, and, and hysteria as FND was then. So I, I have to say, I quite if you know if you're going to divide things up into functional disorders and organic disorders, I actually prefer this division than the one that we have now. Uh, although, as I'll explain at the end, I don't think we should be dividing them up at all. Uh, and there were some of his disorders with an anatomical basis. Uh, instead of the normal picture of Charcot, I thought I'd show one. This is Charcot with his monkey. He was very keen on animals, Charcot, and this is his, uh, his monkey. So some of you might know this quote from, um, from his uh, lectures in neurology, and he was talking about um, hysterical hemiparesis, uh, someone with a monoplegia, I think weakness of their arm. And he's saying uh, the monoplegia is due to a cortical cerebral lesion localized in the motor zone of the arm, but it's not the nature of a gross material alteration. The lesion is purely dynamic, sine materia. Um, so he was, he was talking there about a functional lesion of the brain causing some neurological conditions. And it, yes, he was making a functional organic distinction. Now, because I'm, I've spent so long dealing with uh, FND, you're going to get a bit of FND today. But I think FND is the, is the condition par excellence that really... Um, explodes these problems with... Oh, can I just get you to push against my hand? Our problems with these functional organic dichotomies, they really highlight why we shouldn't have that dichotomy. So we talk about, and we end up using phrases like FND is a disorder at the interface between neurology and psychiatry. Um, why do we say that? Uh, why do, you know, is it telling us that we shouldn't have those two separate specialties um, if there's disorders that somehow don't belong in either? So this is Rachel and she's got right hemiparesis from FND. And I'm doing here her hip abductor sign. And I'm demonstrating on the right side that she's got impairment of voluntary movement, but the automatic movements are normal. So that's how I would define functional leg weakness, that difference between the two things. Um, there isn't a lounge bar pianist in the room that, that was added on afterwards, I'll just let you see. So can I just get you to push against my hand here? we can see when we do that. You're stronger than I am, yeah. and I can't push that knee in. Um, and then I want, let's try and do the same thing with this knee. So stop me from pushing in, push out as strong as you can. But I'm winning there, yeah. pushing your knee in. Let's go back to this side. I want you to push out again as hard as you can. Really stop me, push, 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 push. Now when we do that, we can see that actually what's happening over on the right side 
is that I can't, it's become much stronger and I can't push the knee in now. Mm -hmm. So it's brought out the automatic movement. <clears throat> so I'm making this diagnosis on the base of positive clinical features of the disorder that are recognisable, reproducible between patients um, and stay stable over time. I'm not making a diagnosis because there's no organic lesion. Um, but it's, it's interesting looking at what happened after Charcot, because if you look at textbooks around then, uh, quite, quite a large proportion of them would be devoted to this topic, uh, kind of reflecting how common it was in, in practice. But as the century wore on, it, it got less and less until in most, most neurology textbooks by the 1990s, it basically disappeared. Um, so we've actually had worsening dualism, I think, over, over time, not improving. And that's despite functional disorders being the second commonest reason to see a neurologist. Um, it covers a, a, a variety of symptoms and problems, but even the FND ones, at least 6%. So now I'm going to, Vaughan, I hope you don't mind this, but this is from your paper, your excellent paper. But I will, uh, I do want to just criticise this, this paragraph slightly, because here you've characterised functional neurological disorders that present similarly to neurological disorders, but without evidence for impaired neurophysiology. Now that is of course how many people, most people would characterize them like that. So I'm not, I'm not casting judgment, but that reference there, 27, doesn't, doesn't say that. Um, I think that functional disorders do have uh, their own neurophysiology. Um, and, and as I've said already, how can something be not organic? So I know that, I know that you're just, reflecting what people say, uh, but um, I, think we've, I think many of us in this area have moved on from those kinds of statements and thoughts about this, about this problem. And in doing so, hopefully starting to resolve this functional organic dichotomy. So if you start off with the wrong definition, then you, then you of course do end up with this, uh, with this debate. So can we see these dynamic lesions in the brain that Sharko was talking about? Of course, many of you in the audience, I suspect, have been involved in these kinds of functional imaging studies. If you don't know them particularly, here's one. Uh, patients with functional tremor compared, and I've, I've, and I've always liked this study because it's patients with functional tremor compared to their own uh, voluntary tremor. So it's intra-subject comparison, which helps sort of... Uh, perhaps reduce some of the noise that you see in some other functional MRI studies. Hyperactivity of the right temporoparietal junction, a node in, a, in the network that's responsible uh, for that sense of agency, the feeling that's you that's making a movement. So cause or effect, don't really know, but some evidence that parts of the brain are not working properly uh, and and going along with what the patient says, which is that it looks like a voluntary movement, but it doesn't feel like they're doing it. Um, yeah, and what other organ could, FN, could functional disorders arise from? Is a question I often ask people. And of course, that's just one network that people are interested in. And here's some others, motor networks, attentional networks, cognitive control, limbic, et cetera. You end up with most of the brain, in fact, if you, if you keep going with these things. So, Okay, well, we've got some functional imaging. That's not necessarily very persuasive because you can show a lot of things in functional imaging, especially with small sample sizes. I think perhaps what's more persuasive is that functional disorders are an expected, I would argue, are an expected consequence of how the brain appears to work. So the brain is an organ of prediction. If you don't believe me, uh, then just watch this video, which is on a loop. And as it says there, you will only hear the word you're reading. So your brain predicts what you hear based on what you read. Try to remember to read the other word. Okay, now I'm going to play it one last time, and this time I want you to predict which word you're going to hear. Okay, so just choose one and then predict. So generally speaking, you hear the word that you predict as well as the word that you read. 
And many phenomena in medicine uh, can be understood. Uh, so phenomena that are quite confusing can be understood with the predictive brain model. Um, so phantom limb phenomena, for example, the person's brain predicts that a leg is still there, even though it's no longer there. Um, it's been there a long time and it takes a while for that prediction to change. So the prediction is stronger and outweighs the abnormal bottom-up sensory input telling the brain that the leg is no longer there. So this prediction is not updated by uh, abnormal sensory input. And you could argue that something very similar is happening in FND, there's, except this time there's a prediction that the leg isn't there. And I think leg paralysis, for example, is more often that you know, the leg is weak because the person feels it's not there as much as it's weak. Um, Again, there is sensory input saying something to the contrary, that in fact the leg is there, uh, but once again that prediction is not updated by that sensory input. So it's a bit odd, I think, that we, uh, we would talk about FND as a functional disorder, but we wouldn't talk about phantom limb pain as a functional disorder, uh, when they really have, appear to have very similar mechanisms. So we end up with, in FND, anyway, with these kinds of models that you'll all be familiar with, where there's a whole load of stuff causing the problem, predisposing factors, triggering events, and the brain in the middle, because what other organ could it be? Uh, comorbidities, perpetuating factors, et cetera. And there isn't really room in this model for, where's the organic, where's the non-organic? It's, it's just a non-question. Um, I think there's a legitimate question about is it all is it right to talk about a functional disorder because any change in function must at some level involve change in structure and interesting work looking at structural changes in patients with FND brains but incredibly difficult to sort out cause and effect there. So for me as a simplistic monist uh, there's no problem here the organic functional dichotomy first of all it's not even a dichotomy but even if it was, it has no place in medicine. Um, and this is a great quote from your paper, Vaughan, uh, from Kinnear Wilson, the neurologist at Queen Square in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, perhaps you had it earlier, but it's worth repeating. This dichotomy lingers at the bedside in the medical literature, though it's transparently false and has been abandoned long since by all contemplative minds. Well, that's good. It makes you feel like you've got a contemplative mind if you abandon it. But that's 1940. That's 80 years ago. Well, obviously it hasn't long since been abandoned by all contemplative minds. If anything, what I've shown you is that people have become more entrenched in this dichotomy as time has gone on, particularly neurologists. Um, and I've said that the, the other dichotomy is flawed. So why are we all here? What's the, you know, if Kinnear Wilson had realized that this, that this was transparently false in 1940, why are we having a meeting about it? And, 2022? Well, I think it's because of dualism and because of stigma. That's the problem it, for me. It's not really about uh, philosophy or neuroscience. Um, it's about what these things mean to people and what's a legitimate illness. And I'm sure you have been talking about this. And I wanted to tell you this story about uh, a new scientist, which I was involved with, a journalist writing what was a very good article, I think, about FND. But when it came out, the, the, it wasn't the journalist, it was the editors put this on the cover. Uh, mind over matter, how you can think yourself sick and well again. So that was the, you wouldn't know, necessarily know it, but that was, the, that was the way that they were advertising the article on FND. And the article came with this headline, mind tricks. Symptoms are very real, but all the tests say there's nothing physically wrong. So that was how it came out. Now, the, one of the patients who took part in that article and who I directed the journalist to, so I felt a bit responsible, saw that headline, saw the front of New Scientist and was incredibly upset. In fact, in fact, all the patients who were in it were upset. I could not sleep last night. The thought of this going out to so many people so upsetting because her name was in it, her photo was in the article. Um, 96,000 people seeing this. Um, she quite liked the article, but it's completely ruined by the title and the reference made that we are thinking ourselves ill and can think ourselves better. So I think this is an example of how language is 
and, and in fact i've you know we, we then wrote to the new scientist and said look you've really upset the people involved in this article um they then changed it to they changed it from mind tricks to this which is a bit clunky isn't it but it's a bit better um, but they were a bit puzzled i think why there was a problem because they had uh, i think they said they seen Susanna O'Sullivan's book called all in your head and thought well what's the problem here you know um, here's james marriott in the times saying let's end the stigma of psychosomatic illness um, which you know uh, good for him to write that although lots of these articles still talk about they still continue with a sort of dualistic narrative that you know, we should take these problems seriously even though they are all in the mind is often how they are written rather than actually these disorders are we should think about them differently or we should think about medicine differently and my one of my forays into uh, stigma was very early on i did this article did this study on general neurology outpatients they didn't necessarily have functional disorders most of them didn't um, and we it sort of ended up in the christmas bmj as a kind of sort of joke article <laughs> but actually i think it's uh, it's obviously not a joke article uh, what we were saying what we we're pointing out was that if you asked patient people to think about someone with a weak leg and then the doctor gives them one of these diagnoses down the left hand side would that mean putting it on being mad imagining would it mean a good reason to be off work which i think is quite a nice it's quite a good way of looking at stigma actually is this a is this a condition that your your colleagues would be happy to cover for you if you're off work uh, and from that, we had derived an offence score and a number needed to offend. So the number that you need to tell the patient this diagnosis before one is offended. So you can see hysterical weakness, number needed to offend two, two people before one is offended. Psychosomatic, also very high. Functional did a bit better. It was interesting, a few, some people were offended by stroke. Uh, obviously not quite sure what that meant as well. So stigma is everywhere, just, just in the words themselves. You know, the words mean things to people. They mean putting it on, particularly in relation to a physical symptom. And I'm sure you've been covering some of this today as well. That these, when you look at these words, which are sort of psychological, of some of which relate to FND, some of which are just about the specialty. There's a kind of feeling out there, which is changing slowly, particularly in relation to mental health, uh, that these are sort of things that are not real. Uh, or maybe someone's fault, or maybe you wouldn't be sure if it's okay to cover for them at work if they're off for a few weeks. Whereas a neurological problem, and I would put, you know, FND has been partly successful because it has jumped over to this side. Um, and other words with neuro in them, and I'm guilty of having a dualistic job title because I'm a because I'm a neurologist. Neurological things are real and they're nobody's fault. So this is often how people think, unfortunately. And of course, it's not true, um, but this is what we have to overcome. And this is why I think we're still having this meeting in 2022. And it's interesting to see how FND is portrayed in uh, news stories. So that it's often portrayed as a brain disorder. Well, it is a brain disorder, but you know, it's not a brain disorder as people think of it that you can see on a scan. So it's usually the narrative is someone was told it was all in the mind and then they realized it was a brain disorder. So it's incredibly difficult, I think, for journalists to manage to get there, to find the right language to talk about these disorders. I've, I've discovered that talking to people, to journalists about Havana syndrome and uh, functional tics. It's just really hard for people. Here's some more examples. Overcoming a rare neurological disorder. Well, it is not that rare, but it's rareish, I guess. Um, Another student who was told her paralysis was all in her head. Um, and all the treatments are rather similar. I wondered how I could get a, a little plug in for my website and app. There it is. Neurosym even my, my website, Neurosymptoms, is dualistic, really. I mean, if it was called Psychosymptoms, I don't think it would be very, you know, it probably wouldn't be as popular. Um, uh, so obviously, there are neurological symptoms, but People prefer neurophysio, they prefer neuropsychology to psychology. They prefer brain retraining to mind retraining, certainly in a setting of neurology. 
So this is these are linguistic issues to me um, with dualism. So for me, the challenge is not whether uh, the organic structural divide should be there as justified. Clearly, it shouldn't be. It's a nonsense for me. The challenge is how do we how do we make good on Kinnear Wilson's statement from 1940 that we should have abandoned it long ago? Even in 1940, we should have abandoned it long ago. Well, one way of doing that is just let's just not have an organic category, please. Um, as I've explained, that is, I don't think there's any need for an organic category. If we're having this list like this, and actually I, I was very pleased to see that actually people the, on the web, there is a list like this where functional is just on the list. It's just another category. There is no divide. There's just, here's a group of different categories of things that go wrong with people's bodies and brain and functional disorders is one of them. That would be my solution to the problem as a simplistic monist. I think we're making progress with um, uh, FND partly because we have lots of great patient-led organizations which all have been embracing this mind-brain uh, the sort of mind brain issue in FND. It's not easy, and nobody, not, you know, none of us get it right all the time, I think, but I think it's really encouraging the way this is going. Uh, Lorraine Kelly, patron of FND Hope here. Um, and here's, here's, some, here's an example of uh, anti stigma, anti dualism at work in, in London. So you've got uh, Susanna Pick, uh, a psychologist, and Tim Nicholson, a neuropsychiatrist raising money for FND Hope. And FND Hope are advertising the fact that they're, that these, psycho, these psycho people, psycho, psychologists, neuropsychiatrists are raising money for them. And this is all a good thing. So that's the kind of direction I think we need to go in. So these are my conclusions. I don't think it has any place in neurology or psychiatry. I hope, I hope that's what other people have concluded. Um, but I think the category of functional disorders does have a place um, alongside all of the other categories of disorder because they, they, are, they exist and we can define them and we can diagnose them. So we don't need to get rid of functional disorders. We just need to have them alongside all of the others, just not as an opposite to organic. And for me, the problem is stigma and dualism and not philosophy or neuroscience, but uh, I would like to be educated to the contrary. And thanks to my research group uh, there. So thanks very much.